Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I make a follow up comment? Sure. One comment. Um, the argument the industry is making about um, where we may have unintended consequence of incentivizing the creation of orphan wells. That's exactly the problem. Basically what that says is if for smaller producers who are on the edge and you hit them with this fee and they go out of business, what they say, they're going to leave us the orphan wells. And that's exactly because there is no incentive to include it in your business plan as part of your business. And that's exactly the point we're making. That, that exact point it strengthens the point I made. If you have far more idle wells, the likelihood of ending up with orphan wells, rather than getting ones that are done producing, plugged as you go. And so we, we may not have the right solution in this bill, and, I th but, and maybe we need to tinker with it and, 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 and make it work. We're trying to solve a problem, and, and we're completely open to doing that. And, we, and we're not trying to excessively penalize uh, producers or anything. But we do have this problem right now. It's just not part of business plans to include that cost, and, and it needs to be incorporated so it, it's part of the plan. To put, plug a well when you're done with it. Thank you. Let me go uh, Mr. Hadley and then Mr. Gomez. <laughs> Harper. Uh, Harper, I'm sorry, Mr. Harper. Hadley's over there. H, uh, it's all H's. <laughs> but uh, uh, I won't take your mic away. I thank you very much. Always appreciate it. <laughs> Chair Williams, uh, when we first uh, started talking about these, uh, these issues related to natural resources and petroleum production, uh, I had talked to you about uh, my background uh, in terms of uh, locally growing up uh, from amidst uh, the oil wells, you know, Land that I live on right now uh, is former oil production land and uh, wells idle uh, and active uh, and capped uh, surround uh, where I live, where I went to school, and, uh, and where I grew up. And so I've been able to see a lot of different changes over time in terms of how oil production has happened. Uh, and we have large producer, a large producer, we have um, medium producers uh, and small producers that sometimes own one or two wells. Uh, in the Huntington Beach field, which has been uh, producing since uh, 1920. And um, because it's been produced for so, for so long, uh, and uh, of course of my awareness uh, of being on the council, city council before coming here and our regulation through the uh, fire department, I've seen uh, how much work it takes to be able to uh, pump oil out of the ground. It isn't under pressure. Uh, and it's not just a matter of, you know, just having a storage system of, of it uh, coming up. Uh, there are significant costs uh, in terms of pumping the oil up uh, in terms of, uh, of what's required. And so I can see how uh, there's an economic decision that's, be, that's made by any landowner or any producer of does, it, does the production make sense in the current market environment. And so uh, if I could ask, I know you had touched it a little bit, uh, but is this kind of five-year period, is that enough to accommodate for uh, market cycles uh, that sometimes happen, especially when owners uh, need to keep in mind of what production costs are? No, uh, five years is not necessarily enough to keep up with market cycles. Sometimes market cycles go uh, in, uh, in a longer time frame, which is why the, penal the, the penalty for keeping a well uh, – uh, idle for under 10 years is significantly less than the longer time frames. And the, I think the time frame is a, is a, a substitute, not um, a perfect substitute, but a perfect substitute for risk, right? The longer those wells have been at idle, the more likely it is that the company will never extract, right? Because if that well has been idle even when the price of oil was at an all-time high, then you wonder whether they're ever going to produce from that well again. Well, one thing I've seen is that it, you know, the nature of the oil market seems to be uh, as unpredictable for the insiders uh, just as much uh, as an outsider for me. And sometimes uh, when you start uh, putting the money into uh, improving your, your wells uh, for the stock, uh, sometimes by the time that you're done, that cycle has already finished up. And so I imagine that every producer has to go through that period of being able to figure out, will my investment pay off? And we've seen that uh, within our own fields. We had uh, 
the largest producer, uh, sunk a lot of uh, costs uh, into, uh, into being able to be prepared to be able to have the capacity to produce twice as much uh, as the predecessor owner, uh, only to find oil prices now falling to the point uh, that they are right now. And it's a very difficult position uh, that they have. And so uh, to me, why does it make sense to so much incentivize capping wells uh, when in the future, as technology improves, uh, as safety equipment improves, uh, why would we want uh, these important assets to uh, energy uh, within the state of California uh, when they're able to do in the future more distance, more flexibility, and do it in a safer way? Why should we be depleting our uh, inventory of, uh, of p potentially producing wells? Because the evidence isn't that the fluctuation in number of idle wells is based on how many wells that might produce in the future. Um, and, and your entire argument rests on that hope. And what I would say is that when it can cost as little as $100 a year to leave a well idle, but it's going to cost you thousands or tens of thousands to cap that well, just do the math. It's cheaper for you to call it an idle well. Then you don't have to do anything. And unfortunately, some people are making that business decision. Otherwise, you might see uh, the number of idle wells be significantly less when the price of, of oil is $100 a barrel. Well, of course, there's the, uh, the challenge that you have in terms of figuring out what are the best ways to be able in the future. Uh, as technology improves, sometimes you can make it so that uh, idle wells today could be the idles, uh, could be the wells that replace uh, the need for offshoring uh, because you can utilize the distance, flexibility, uh, et cetera. And so your idle wells uh, can be uh, tomorrow's successful ability to be able to uh, replace uh, potentially less desirable ways to extract petroleum. The third uh, and last area of questions I had uh, is in terms of uh, obviously a capped well uh, is much less of an asset or a, or a value uh, in terms of a field. Uh, has there been any study done in terms of impact uh, on uh, the assessed valuation uh, of, uh, of the tax rolls? Uh, if you have a potentially less valuable field, uh, are you indeed potentially having a situation where many of our coastal communities uh, may indeed uh, have less uh, of the taxable uh, ability to be able to, uh, to, to produce revenue uh, based upon this real estate? I, I, I've not seen a study. I would be open to seeing a study, but I can tell you that property values are definitely impacted when there's a leaking well uh, right offshore or right onshore next to that property, well, well, and they are negatively affected. Well, of course, I'm, I'm talking in terms of what the industrial property, the biggest property taxpayer in my home city is that largest property, uh, is, is that uh, largest uh, producer of oil. And if their asset is less valuable, then they may end up producing le much less property taxes as a result. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Gomez. Uh, yeah, I'm going to vote for the bill. I, I do have some questions. One of them is, um, first, the economics of how much um, oil is produced and how much isn't in a given state is very, I guess for the, for the layman, it's very difficult to assess. You know, the rural um, oil markets are often having a profound impact on how much different regions are producing. I read something from, um, I think it was in uh, uh, Wall Street Journal that said Saudi Arabia is producing as uh, much oil as possible in order to dri drive the, the price of oil down, in order to force local producers are producing the more expensive um, oil to uh, cut back production, so that causes the production, the cost of the barrel per oil to raise. Um, and so I really don't know how much they could actually increase oil production in the state when oil prices of oil are actually high without actually impacting the price of oil in the in the opposite direction. Um, so economics around um, oil production is, uh, for me, it's kind of in a black hole sometimes. Um, however, uh, so that's kind of my, my statement on, on that. The question I have is out of the um, 20,000 idle wells, do we have a 
any idea of how many are actually having some kind of um, environmental issues, uh, leaking or cracking or any of the, the um, issues that you mentioned in this analysis? I don't think we do, which is why we agree with the industry that, t that testing and uh, having integrity or a risk assessment as part of the rubric that determines fees would be ideal uh, if, if we can have that rubric. Uh, more information uh, 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 <coughs> would, be, would be better. I would much rather have um, higher risk wells pay higher fees and lower risk wells pay lower fees. And if the industry is in agreement, that, that is something that we have common ground on. And the, the higher risk versus lower risk is just based on the number of years that the, the well has been idle? Yep. Or a right variety. now, that is because that's the system that we've inherited. Okay. That's current code. Not we're we're only changing the dollar figures okay. in that. Um, so the 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 I agree that it it would it may be possible to come up with a better rubric. Um, we are open to that, and and that's where I I do think that there is some common ground here. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gomez. Any other committee members' comments or questions? I just have two closing or final questions, I guess. I'll go last. Um, can you speak to uh, as much as you can and be brief, please? There's probably been textbooks and engineering studies to answer this question, but for the purposes of the committee, be brief on, you know, what is the foundation of the business decision to keep these um, wells idle and you know I, i'm probably less concerned about the five-year ones as i am you know why would you keep an, a well idle for 45 years and then the second thing is there's i'm sure there's uh, <coughs> other states that have dealt with this what are other states around the country doing a deal with idle wells if either one of the sure. and actually the questions to the opponents of the bill if, if they sure if they um, want to speak to that of course World market conditions are, are, are a factor in anything that you do with in, in the oil industry, but contrary to popular belief, it's actually more efficient to have an idle well be uh, used rather than trying to drill a new well. There's more environmental uh, restrictions. There's more disturbance to land. So having that idle well sit there and be used at some point in the future is actually better for the environment and the economy. So it, it's really this perverse... Uh, thought that, well, if we cap the wells and abandon them, then that's going to make everything better. That's not actually the case. I think if we have more risk, ass risk assessment, better testing, and get this database, then we can find out which wells are actually causing the problem. Did Just a couple of things. Um, there are some couple of comments, um, one by the director indicating that he's not sure if this bill is the answer. I would happen to agree with that, that it, it may not be the answer. Um, but I do want to reiterate, members, that we plug two to 3,000 wells per year. Members, I, I, I can't say it any clearer. Our, our, our members are in the business of making a living, and they employ people, and they pay their taxes. So from the standpoint of if there is something that is damaging to this environment, there are over 20 regulatory agencies that we deal with. I think you would have found it by now. The speculation and the thoughts and, and the possibilities, well, those are those. But the facts still remain that if this industry, given the strongest environmental regulations in the nation and arguably the world, if we were in problems, we'd have a different bill. This bill here, this bill right here, is not the answer. Not after we plug, not after we abandon. It's an economic situation. And our, my members deal with the air every day. They deal with the water every day. They deal with animals every day. My members are the environmentalists here. It is my members who have to deal with this regulation on a day-to-day -day basis. And I would just humbly say to this committee that, in fact, the longer sustainable wells, I would agree with my counterpart, is better for the environment rather than having to, in fact, pull the permits, drill another well, and deal with the issues that, in fact, 
you have to deal with when you're drilling a new well. When it's done, it's already done. And when it's time to abandon it, it is completely sealed with no environmental impacts to it. Thank you. Uh, with all comments and questions being over and answers, we need a motion. No McCarty, Garcia. Uh, Mr. Thurman, Mr. Williams, you may close. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank my joint author, some member Williams, in authoring AB 2729. With some 20,000 idle oil and gas wells across the state that are near people's homes, drinking water sources, and agriculture, these pose serious health concerns. Uh, these wells, even though they're not in production, they're susceptible to leaking and contaminating groundwater sources. And the last thing that we want for our communities is to have contaminated water. In order to prevent any hazard to the environment and communities, we need to create a stronger incentive to plug abandoned and idle wells. Uh, AB 2729 will create the hazardous and idle deserted well abatement fund where the fees collected from violations will then be used to plug abandoned wells. And I respectfully ask for your I vote on AB 2729. We'll call the roll. The motion is due passes amended and re referred to Environmental Safety and Toxic Materials Committee. Williams? Aye. Williams, aye. Jones? No. Jones, no. Garcia? Aye. Garcia, aye. Gomez? Aye. Gomez, aye. Hadley? Harper? No. Was that? No. Thank you. <laughs> no. McCarty? Aye. McCarty, aye. Stone? Aye. Stone, aye. Wood? Aye. Wood, aye. Looks like uh, that's out, right? Six is out. Looks like your bill is out. Good, good job coordinating your testimony and your ties. <laughs> oh, well, look at that. It, 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 it may have to do with a thing about his district. <laughs> Go Bears. <laughs> uh, last bill of the evening. We've moved from the early afternoon to the almost late evening now. Uh, is. Uh, AB 1882, and Mr. Williams looks like you're going to present this on your own, huh? I, I am, and, All right. and I, I'm trying to, on the fly, shorten my testimony. Um, Mr. Chair and members, uh, 2011 uh, US EPA audit of Dogger's underground injection control program uh, concluded that Dogger was both misclassifying underground sources of drinking water and insufficiently monitoring the program uh, to make matters worse in 2014 it was discovered that dogger was approving injection wells in aquifers still protected by the, the safe drinking water act so underground injection control is taking wastewater from oil and putting it into to the ground um, uh, some of these projects have injected into aquifers that could have had beneficial use in this urgent time in the middle of the drought uh, either not necessarily drinking water standards, but at least good enough for ag water. Uh, this bill allows uh, the uh, State Water Resources Control Board uh, or the appropriate Regional Water uh, Quality Control Board to require groundwater monitoring as a condition of its concurrence with Dogger uh, if it meets uh, certain criteria. Uh, uh, witnesses in support. And uh, I'll remind the witnesses that we're limited to two minutes for three witnesses. Bill Alio for the Environmental Working Group. <clears throat> in 2010, the uh, supervisor of Dogger sent a memo to its employees saying you need to do a lot better job on the UIC, the Underground Injection Control Program. And these things apparently were mostly not implemented. In 2011, US EPA Region 9 put out a thick critique of the UIC saying a lot of things were wrong and Dogger didn't respond to a number of those things until recently. When I first started working with Dogger in 2011, they told me point blank, we're, what we do, our bread and butter is we know how wells work and well regulations and casings. We are not good at water quality. They don't have the expertise. So fast forward to now, they do have an old MOU from the 80s, which was really just on paper. They're now working on a new one. We look forward to that, but in the interim, AB 1882 is needed to make sure that the water board is fully functional and integrated with Dogger and can give the information and the checkoffs needed as per the bill. Thank you. 
Keith Nakatani, Clean Water Action. Our mission is to protect the environment, the health, um, and economic well-being of communities. We'd like to thank the chairman for introducing this bill and for your leadership on oil and gas issues. 1882 is needed for the simple reason, as you heard, that underground injection control program has failed to protect public health and groundwater resources. As you've heard, thousands of oil and gas wells were inappropriately permitted, and oil and gas wastewater has been injected into federally protected aquifers. This threatens groundwater that could be used for drinking or irrigation and violates the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. It's especially bad during times of drought when groundwater makes up as much as 60% of the state's water supply. Moreover, many low-income communities rely on groundwater for 100% of their water supply. 1882 will help fix the problem. The good news is it's a simple fix. It requires that Dogger coordinate with the state water board or the appropriate regional water board in assessing existing underground injection projects. This makes sense because Dogger is working hard to improve its track record, but institutional change takes time. So while Dogger improves its performance, its performance collaboration with the state water board will better help make this happen. 1882 enables the Water Board to ensure that ongoing dogger reviews are exi of existing improperly permitted wells are proceeding appropriately. Moreover, the legislature approved a similar rationale in a budget trailer last year, SB 83, which required that dogger and the State Water Board coordinate on new aquifer exemptions, and that is working well. 1882 is significantly different from SB 83 in that it requires Dogger and State Water Board coordination on existing underground injection projects. In other words, 1882 will address the thousands of improperly permitted UIC projects that threaten public health and the environment. We urge your aye vote. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Monica Miller on behalf of the Santa Barbara County Board of Supervisors in support. Thank you. Somebody broke it earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Other witnesses in support? If you can give your name and affiliation, please. Uh, Steve Wallach on behalf of the Ventura County Board of Supervisors, also in support of this bill. Thank you. Any other witnesses in support? And I'll, I'll just tell you that like a good state agency that hasn't yet gotten sign off from the governor, they, they are not in support nor opposition, but uh, the State Water Board is here to give some, some input. Yes, I was asked to, um, to explain what the current practice is between Dogger and, um, and the water boards. And so currently, uh, the water boards and Dogger have an agreement that all project reviews, both for new projects and re projects that they're reviewing, that they will uh, send a copy of the application over to the, to the regional water board and the state water board for review, and that um, Dogger has agreed to include any conditions required by the water boards in the um, project permits, and that um, Dogger will not um, issue a permit approval without concurrence from the water boards. As you heard earlier, the um, water boards and Dogger are working on an MOA to, um, to memorialize this. Right now, it's just an agreement between the management. Um, currently, we have received the water boards 24 projects, uh, UIC projects to uh, proposals. We have provided concurrence on 21 of them. Uh, of the three remaining projects, two did not receive concurrence from the water boards due to concerns of, with potential impacts to beneficial use, and one is still under review. According to Dogger's renewal plan, there are approximately 900 projects that need to be reviewed, covering 30,000 wells. Um, this project by project review is expected to take two years. Um, the water boards are expected to review each of these projects and provide conditions, concurrence, or non-concurrence as appropriate. This is a significant new workload that it came out this year with the renewal plan that you heard earlier was uh, uh, published in October, November timeframe. And the water boards will need to look at that and the resources implications associated with it. Thank you. Thank you. It sounds like we're having a party back here behind the dais. Sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, witnesses in opposition? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, Brian White on behalf of the Western States Petroleum Association. Uh, not here to see if I can get a hat trick with Mr. Williams, but uh, we are opposed to the bill. Uh, we think this bill would create 
a confusing and duplicative permitting uh, process for underground injection permits. It would override Dogger's permitting authority without providing any additional environmental or groundwater protection beyond what's already provided under existing law. We think this bill would prohibit Dogger, which is the lead state agency, by the way, over oil and gas uh, production operations, from approving any proposed underground injection permit unless they get authorization from the state water board or the regional water boards first. So essentially this bill puts the water board in the driver's seat and negates Dogger's own authority, which would effectively make two separate state agencies responsible for the same job. It confused the way in which state regulators are now managing injection and disposal wells and duplicates the current work that's already being done between federal EPA and Dogger with uh, no measurable improvement. And this is based on whether or not uh, protected waters are beneficial use or could reasonably be used for beneficial use. The so-called written concurrence that's in the bill, the language that's in the, in the bill, uh, would have to be conceded by state water board before a project could move. The water board's written concurrence would have to contain additional protective measures or must explain why additional protective measures are not required to protect waters of beneficial use. This first requirement contains no statutory explanation or guidance for providing, uh, proposing additional requirements, and the latter requ requirement basically creates a, a negative. To us, we don't know if this bill is intended to create denial of permits, delay of permits, or at worst, uh, more litigation. There's already plenty of law on the books to deal with this issue. Uh, we had the budget trailer bill last year, which we were okay with. We did not oppose that bill. Uh, we ha also have the MOA that was mentioned. That's already going through, uh, the, through the process. And Dogger did a comprehensive review of 50,000 wells under the, uh, under the work plan and found out there is no contamination to groundwater supplies. So the question we ask is what is this bill actually trying to solve? Uh, if it's to ensure injection wells are not impacting groundwater, we think that's already being done. It's already covered under the uh, federal and state laws and will continue to be as long as the federal EPA and Dogger and the Water Board are working together. We don't need this extra review. It's already being done. Uh, we think at, at best this bill is highly subjective and presents an open-ended permit process with no time constraints at all. We're opposed to the bill. Uh, Mr. Chairman and, and members, um, Anthony Thomas, representing the California Independent Petroleum Association, um, trying not to echo too many of my counterparts' comments here, but the mandate by the state board uh, and the designated regional board to comment, just to comment on, and then just understand what these terms are meaning. Comment, then propose additional requirements. Creates multiple issues for operators. One, the bill itself, this bill, this page document, does not designate any timeline for either entity to complete their process. So they can go on infinitely. And again, members in my last testimony, I talked about our, our members are business people. So every day that they're not doing their business, they're losing. And every day that they're losing, they're not contributing to the tax base of the state. We see no benefit to additional regulatory involvement by these two agencies, or at least we've not been provided any. The bill does not enhance oversight. It does not enhance accountability within the UIC program, but it does create a log jam of paperwork. And if you don't believe this, pass this bill in its current form and see what happens. Well, maybe we don't want to see that happen, but who knows? Um, we're interested in what major problem 1882 is attempting to solve. At this point, we do not see any. The regulatory agencies are not necessarily known for expediting responses back to my members, uh, nor their willingness to accelerate any or provide any timeliness on a consistent basis. The bill does not respond nor fix a problem impacting groundwater. If this is the case, it isn't defined here in this particular bill. Now. The member, excuse me, the author has reached out to the industry for input on this particular measure. We do have a meeting scheduled for later on this month. Um, given that, we think it'd be in a good faith effort, since the member has reached out to us, since the member wants input on this, we think a good faith effort would be to hold the bill in committee, allow us to work on it. Bills in committee are supposed to be worked on in committee, not necessarily passed through the process. And we would see it as a good faith effort and it would bring us even stronger to the table. With that, in its current form, we have to stand opposed. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? If you could state your name and affiliation, please. Amy Mago on behalf of the California Chamber of Commerce in opposition. Thank you. Any other witnesses in opposition? Member comments and or questions? 
and or Facebook sharing pages. Um, to the authors, uh, or author, Mr. Williams, would you like to close? Sure, I will try to briefly respond. Um, the This has been a, a uh, several year odyssey. Um, the basic question I think at hand is whether the agency that is in charge of making sure that our beneficial use water, that is drinking water and ag water, is safe, should have a regulatory role. And we think that they should. Uh, the first objection that the industry brought up is that the first testing requirement on the previous bill uh, was too broad, that it included uh, uh, wells that are not close enough to a beneficial use aquifer um, or that are close to water with too um, uh, uh, bad of a TDS total dissolved solids level to ever be beneficial use. So we've constrained that to simply be aquifers that are be of beneficial use or potential benefit beneficial use. The um, that, that constrainment, along with uh, essentially just codifying the, um, the fact that the agency should have sign-off and be able to impose, and this is important, as a condition of that sign-off, water quality testing. Um, so I just submit to you that uh, the water board, if it's not the water board's uh, job to make sure our drinking water is safe, I don't know whose job it is, and with respect to Dogger, that is not their primary area of expertise. Thank you, Mr. Williams. We have a motion by Mr. Stone and a tie for second with uh, Ms. Garcia and Mr. Wood. Uh, we'll call, I'm sorry? I'll let Mr. Wood I'll Oh. <laughs> I'll give her. <laughs> My technical assistant, actually, it was not We'll call the roll. <laughs> The motion is do you pass and re-refer to Appropriations Committee. Williams? Aye. Williams, aye. Jones? No. Jones, no. Garcia? Aye. Garcia, aye. Gomez? Aye. Gomez, aye. Hadley? Harper? No. Harper, no. McCarty? Aye. McCarty, aye. Stone? Aye. Stone, aye. Wood? Aye. Wood, aye. That uh, bill has six votes to two. I think that's enough to get out. And for those listening in their offices, for the members that have been absent, I'll let Mr. Williams announce how long he'll keep the roll open so they can add on. Only briefly, so you better get down here. Go through them one by one. We'll just go by an order and not differentiate um, between ones that have already passed and ones that are You want to just go through all of them? Sir? Yeah. Let me get them back in order then. Sorry about that. We'll start with um, the first. The first file item, file item is, is Gomez, uh, AB number 1550 by Gomez. Chair's recommendation is aye. Calling the absent members, Harper. McCarty. Aye. McCarty, aye. That's 7-0. Uh, 1569. 1569 by Steinorth. Uh, this is a CEQA exemption. Chair's recommendation is no. Calling uh, absent members Gomez. Which one? 1569. 1569. Chair's rec recommendation is no. No. Gomez, no. Hadley. Stone. No. Stone, no. Vote is 3-5, uh, and I no I'll notice reconsideration. 
that fails but is granted reconsideration. We need to follow. Williams? No. For reconsideration. Oh, for reconsideration, yeah. Yes. Yes. Motion. Williams? Aye. Jones? You can just say without objection. Yeah, without objection, we will grant him reconsideration. That's a little. That's three to five. You did. You voted no. But. Okay. 1586. The motions do pass as amended to re refer to Judiciary Committee calling absent members Garcia. Oh, uh, this is uh, 1586 by Mathis. It's another CEQA exemption. No. Garcia, no. Gomez? No. Gomez, no. Hadley? Harper? Stone? No. Stone, no. That's one six. Uh, but without objection, we will grant uh, Mr. Mathis reconsideration. Next bill is 1589 by Mathis. It is a CEQA exemption. Uh, chair's recommendation is no. Gomez? No. Gomez, no. Hadley? Harper? It is 1 6, uh, but without, uh, that, that fa fails, but. Uh, Without, it, without objection, we will grant him reconsideration. Uh, 1647 was pulled by the author. Uh, 1657 by O'Donnell. Uh, public ports and intermodal terminals. Calling absent members Garcia. Aye. Garcia, aye. Harper. Aye. Harper, aye. That is 8-0. That is out. Wood, I'm sorry. Nine zero. Nine zero. My apologies. Uh, 1698 and 1749 were pulled. Uh, AB 1815 by Alejo. Disadvantaged communities. Motion is due pass as amended. Re refer to appropriations committee calling absent member Garcia. Aye. Garcia, aye. Harper? No. Harper, no. Stone? Aye. Stone, aye. Wood? Aye. Wood, aye. 7 2, that bill is out. 1882 by Williams. Chair's recommendation is. <laughs> 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 right. Hadley? That was it. That was it. No, it's out. That's also out. 1905 by Wilk. Gomez? Gomez, I. Hadley? Harper? Yes. Harper, I. Eight zero, that bill is out. 1958 by Wood. Forest Practices, Oak Woodlands. Chair's recommendation is I. Garcia? Aye. Garcia, I. Gomez? Aye. Gomez, I. Harper? Yes. Harper, I. McCarty? Aye. McCarty, I. Nine zero. That is out. Yes. I have you as a yes. Twenty one forty six. Twenty one forty six by Patterson. Uh, this is uh, forestry and fire protection GHG emissions. I know you're shocked, but the chair's recommendation is I. <laughs> Garcia. I. Garcia. I. Wood. I. Wood. I. 9-0, that bill is out. Uh, 2171 by Jones. Coastal Resources Development Review Appeals. Chair's recommendation is no. Garcia? No. Garcia, no. Gomez? No. Gomez, no. McCarty? No. McCarty, no. <laughs> 2 7, uh, that bill fails, but uh, without. Objection, we will grant uh, reconsideration. Uh, 2181 by Brown. Chair's recommendation is I. Uh, public contract specif specifications. Gomez? Aye. Gomez, I. Hadley? Harper? No. Harper, no. Wood? Um. This is 2181 by Brown. Yes, 
would I? Six one, that bill is out. <clears throat> 2189 by Irwin. Uh, this is Rim of the Valley Trail. Would? Yes. Would I? Nine zero. That bill is out. AB 2223 by Gray Manure Digesters. Chair's recommendation is aye. Oh, we have a full vote. That bill is out. AB 2293 by Garcia. Uh, GHE Assistance Green Assistance Program. Chair's recommendation is aye. Harper? Yes. Harper, aye. Uh, 2438 by Waldron has been pulled. Uh, 2543, which is consent calendar. Uh, Harper? Yes. Harper, aye. That bill is out. 2576 by Gray. Uh, Glass container recycling. Harper? No. Harper, no. 7 2, that bill is out. 27 29 by Williams. Hadley? Twenty-seven fifty-six by Thurmond. Oh, everyone voted. That bill is out as well. So I believe that everyone's voted. You guys can get out of here. I'll, I'll wait. Um, I want to spend the night here, so. <laughs> <laughs> My approach hearing is for shorter. Sure. <laughs> 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 uh, I will... Uh, thank you, Ms. Garcia. Ne next time, next time uh, we may just decide that there will be only one GHG bill. <laughs> I hereby adjourn the meeting of the Assembly Natural Resources Committee. <laughs>